Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. We'll be getting started with introductions in just a moment, so please make yourselves comfortable. Before we begin, a quick note about Q&A for those of you joining us live in the Zoom webinar. You should see a control in the bottom of your Zoom interface labeled Q&A. Later on, you'll have the opportunity to use this control to submit typed questions to us, which professors Brian Murchison and Jeremy Weisman from the Roger Mudd Center for Ethics will read out for our guests to address. We appreciate your understanding as we ask that you refrain from submitting your questions until invited to do so by our guest. Once again, we'll be getting started after a short delay to allow more time for attendees to join the webinar. Thank you for your patience. Thank you everyone for your patience. At this time, I would like to turn things over to Professor Mark Rush, Director for International Education and Stanley D. and Nikki Waxberg, Professor of Politics and Law at WNL, to give the introduction for tonight's guest speaker and topic. Hi everyone and good evening. I'm Mark Rush, I'm Director of the Center for International Education here at Washington and Lee, and it's my pleasure to do the introductions for this evening's co-sponsored lecture. Uh, between the, uh, the Center and the Mudge Center for Ethics. Uh, our speaker this evening is Dr. Valerie Hudson, who comes to us from the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M, where she also serves as University Distinguished Professor, and she is the holder of the George H.W. Bush Chair there. Uh, in addition, she also directs the Bush School's Program on Women, Peace, and Security. Dr. Hudson is a, is a prolific scholar and researcher. Uh, her CVA, her list of publications is just tremendous. Uh, in addition, she has developed uh, the Women's Stats database that contains literally hundreds of thousands of data points on numerous variables spanning international security, demographics, democratic development and democratization, uh, and the status of women. Her books include Sex and World Peace, The Hillary Doctrine, Sex and American Foreign Policy, and Bear Branchers, Security Implications of Asia's Surplus Male Population. And uh, that last book received numerous national book awards. Um, I find Valerie Hudson's work to be uh, inspiring and also, frankly, just uh, stunning. Uh, her use of demographic data, gender data, uh, to make us rethink uh, traditional views of international politics, of security, of the impact of democratization and so forth. Uh, I, I just find her scholarship tremendous on a personal level, but anecdotally, I can tell you too that its impact on students in all of my classes has been um, tremendous. Uh, they have all stopped and really rethought their own predilections and beliefs based on much of Valerie's work. And it really has been a pleasure uh, to introduce her to our students, uh, both through syllabi and also through this venue this evening. Uh, to no one's surprise then, I can tell you that in 2009, Foreign Policy Magazine uh, named Valerie one of the uh, top 100 most influential global thinkers. Uh, it comes as no surprise given her extensive research and publishing. The title of her talk tonight draws upon her current work by the same name. Her book is entitled The First Political Order, How Sex Shapes Governance and National Security Worldwide. Um, so welcome to what's soon to be a uh, sure to be a, a tremendous discussion this evening, and it's my pleasure now to turn the program over to this evening's guest speaker, Dr. Valerie Hudson. Thanks and welcome, Valerie. Thank you so much. Thank you to um, Professor Rush for that wonderful introduction, and I'm grateful for all the assistance that Professor Murchison and Professor Weissman have given us today. I'm grateful to the Mud Center for this invitation. And I only wish that I could be with you in person, but uh, alas, the world has changed. And uh, so this will have to do for the time being. Um, I am going to discuss my most recent uh, work. And so um, give me a moment while I grab my PowerPoint presentation and we will get that started. 
All right, good. Um, Patrick, can you give me a thumbs up if you think that that looks like it's working? Everything looks good. Wonderful. Thank you very much. All right. Um, this talk is about a book that was published uh, almost a year ago. Uh, and the book is The First Political Order, How Sex Shapes Governance and National Security Worldwide. Uh, the book is 612 pages, so I am telling you that uh, there is a lot more uh, that we can discuss in the Q&A or offline uh, that uh, I, I cannot shoehorn into this evening's presentation. Uh, but if you're interested in what we we're talking about tonight, I urge you to uh, put this on your nightstand. I think you'll find it a fascinating reading. All right, let's see if I can get this to change. There we go. Okay. Now, it's uh, it, it certainly is no um, new type of thought to suggest that the first political order in any society is actually the sexual political order that is established between males and females in the society. Uh, sometimes to introduce that thought, I actually tell my students, why don't we pretend that we're in a, um, a, a video game design class uh, and not an international affairs class. And so I want you to design a video game for me. And the only parameters I'm going to give you is that um, by and large, there are two roughly equal size groups uh, of players, neither of which all right, um, can uh, go on to the next round without the other. That is to say, unless those two groups cooperate, the game is over. There is no next round. Uh, and I say, build me a game. And they say, Professor Hudson, we don't have enough information to build a game. You have to tell us a little bit about these groups. Do they stand before each other as equals or is one group kind of a superior group and one group kind of a subordinate group? Uh, how are decisions made for the group? Are they made by one of these groups or by both? Uh, and if they disagree, how are those conflicts resolved? Are they resolved uh, peacefully? Are they resolved by force, domination, and coercion? And then, of course, the ultimate political question, how are resources, valuable resources, distributed equally um, between the two groups? Or are they, um, can one group uh, have greater claim on resources or even extort resources from the other group. And I say, bingo, uh, you've just hit the nail on the head. These are deeply political questions. So the sexual political, the sexual order in any society is a deeply, deeply political order. And it establishes, if you will, what the society will come to see as the natural normative um, uh, uh, character of politics uh, and conflict resolution within the society. Now, where should we look to see that order? Well, certainly I think that we need to look at the situation, status, and security of women. We need to look at the, the, the relative level of empowerment of women in the society. However, uh, after a crucial conversation to that took place almost uh, over a dozen years ago, uh, I have come to feel that I was looking for those indicators of empowerment in the wrong place. Um, and that uh, conversation that I had was over lunch. Uh, my university was hosting a group of the first female um, MPs in Afghanistan. And uh, I was having lunch uh, being sort of the personal uh, hostess for one of the MPs and not knowing exactly how to break the ice. You know, I said, you know, I, I'm so hopeful when I look at you, here you are, you know, you're university educated, you're a practicing physician, and now you're an MP in Afghanistan. Um, we're really seeing greater empowerment of women in that country, aren't we? And she sort of stopped me and said, Valerie, you don't understand. She said, I could go home today and my husband could divorce me simply by saying, I divorce you three times. And if he did, I would not have custody of my children because in Afghanistan, custody of the children goes to the father. 
And she said, furthermore, I would have no place to live for my, my father's family would not take me in because of the dishonor. And further, she said to me, even if I'm not divorced, I have, may have very little say in whom my children marry or at what age they marry. So how empowered am I really, Valerie? And I realized that uh, you can have high female literacy and you can have the subordination of women. And Saudi Arabia is an example of that. You could have high female labor force participation as you see in the Philippines and yet have the subordination of women. You could have the highest female parliamentary representation in the world, which you would find in the country of Rwanda. And you could still not say that women in Rwanda uh, were, were treated as equals. Uh, in other words, there's something prior to these kinds of downstream indicators. Uh, and what I became very interested in was the first political order at the household level between males and females who are living together. And so I'm interested in the kinds of questions that uh, my acquaintance was, uh, was turning me towards, such as how much say does a woman have about getting married? How old is she when she's married? Um, once she is married, what kind of say does she have in her marriage? What types of property and inheritance rights do women have? Are there inequities in family law, such as what she was talking about concerning divorce and child custody? Is marriage patrilocal, where brides tend to go live with their husband's family? Are bride price or dowry paid? What about polygyny and cousin marriage? Does society view domestic violence and femicide as normal, even expected, even at times obligatory? And is rape treated more as a property crime? So not so much a crime against the woman, but a property crime against her guardian, that is either her husband or her father. It seems to me we get a lot closer to seeing the first political order in a society by asking these types of questions. So as we endeavor to be to, to get ourselves to the point where we could actually do research on this, that is how important was women's household level disempowerment in nation state outcomes, um, we uh, came up with this diagram, which we think sort of puts together um, the main components of what we're calling the syndrome. And what we mean by that is the syndrome a first political order of the subjugation of women, the subjugation of female interest to male interest within the society. Uh, and so the types of things that we talk about um, here would be uh, levels of women's insecurity, right? Uh, the level of violence against women in the society. And then we would ask questions about um, uh, whether it is uh, males as versus females that control access to the most important resources. Um, whether women actually lack rights to hold property um, or um, uh, other types of uh, property rights, such as inheritance. Uh, we would then see that if males do control such assets, we usually see a patrilineal kind of social organization where valuable resources are passed from father to son to grandson and where women marry out from the family. So they're not considered part of their natal family and they're not considered part of the family into which they marry. From this, of course, springs a generalized preference for sons, especially in nations where there is no social security. It is sons that provide social security to the elderly because they are part of that patrilineal family line. Uh, and from that son preference, we can see a deep devaluation of the um, lives of daughters and wives, a, a real lack of investment in the lives of women. We also see springing from that fairly naturally a, a fairly depressed age of marriage for girls. Uh, because girls are not considered truly family because they marry out, um, uh, natal families may wish them to marry as, uh, as as early an age as possible. And from all of this, you begin to see a codification in customary law or tribal law or even national law of a subordinate status for women. Coming up that left-hand side, 
um, we see kind of uh, two variants of a, of a very um, subordinative order for women. Um, in countries where women's labor is viewed as valuable, we often see the rise of what we call a bride price polygyny society where grooms have to pay the bride's father for the right to contract marriage and where rich men may marry numerous women in order to further increase uh, their wealth. Um, and then uh, it's also possible that if women's um, labor is not considered valuable that you see what we call a dowry sex ratio alteration society which is most clearly seen in India where the bride's family must pay the groom's family for the right to contract a marriage. Uh, and as a result, many um, economically rational families say, uh, we can't afford to have daughters. And so through means such as sex selective abortion or female infanticide, they would cull uh, girls from the birth population. So what we found with this syndrome is it acts kind of like a straitjacket on women. Uh, and oftentimes where you have uh, a few of these, you end up kind of with the full set of magnetic beads, right, that create this kind of straitjacket. I think where we add to the literature is to suggest that this syndrome, right, kind of a, a patrilineal system designed to increase the fraternity among men by subordinating female interests to male interests uh, is really a, a monster right? It's, it's not just a monster for women, right? It doesn't just strangle women, uh, but it strangles men and, and children and whole societies, um, holding them in the grasp of something that is, is going to keep them from having good outcomes for their collectives and for their families. Um, governance by these extended male kin networks in these patrilineal fraternal systems um, we argue leads to unfortunate outcomes for the group, instability, violence, terror, corruption, and autocracy. And that's because it's built upon a household first political order of domestic instability, domestic violence, domestic terror, domestic corruption, domestic autocracy. So that first political order will be determinative of the larger political order within the society. Furthermore, we also argue that uh, what we call syndrome encoding countries that deeply subjugate women will also experience other ramifications, other consequences, because uh, many um, activities are gendered as female. So healthcare is gendered as female. It is the wife and mother who is in charge of the health of the family. Um, food security is often gendered female. It is the women who must make sure that the women and the children eat uh, and so forth, that we believe that there will also be negative outcomes in terms of things like health and food security. We also anticipate lower economic performance because when you completely preclude the contribution of half of your population with their skills and talents and insights, you're really hobbling yourself in an economic sense. And of course, there are demographic consequences to the subjugation of women. And also, um, we believe even there will be a lack of attention to environmental security, because in almost every culture, uh, the earth is actually gendered female, Mother Earth. And so how you treat women is how you're going to treat Mother Earth, another female as well. In other words, if there's any takeaway that I, I want you to bring from this discussion today, it's what you do to your women, you do to your nation state. And so if you decide to curse your women, you will wind up cursing your nation state as well. Um, we were able uh, through procuring a Minerva initiative grant from the US Department of Defense to collect a boatload of information that allowed us, if you will, to count how many of those syndrome components were present in any particular culture. And so you can see a map here that in essence counts how many um, there are. And you know, not surprisingly, you see um, the, the extreme subjugation of women in parts of the world that are very poor, but we also see subjugation of women 
in countries that have strong rentier economies and are therefore not poor but rich, um, such as Saudi Arabia. But we also see uh, globally other nations that are still uh, somewhat affected by this legacy of the, the first political order, China, the post-Soviet Central Asian states, Latin America, and so forth. Now, to help you kind of see some of the linkages that we see between what's going on with women and what's going on with nation state outcomes, especially in terms of, of national security, uh, let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, and note that there's a plethora of examples in the book that we look at. Sometimes these links that we see are pretty immediate and, and proximate. Remember that we talked about bride price, where a groom's family pays the bride's family for the purposes of contracting the marriage. Well, bride price is a very interesting uh, custom because it acts, if you will, as a re regressive but universal uh, flat tax on the subpopulation of young men. Because except at the uh, very elite levels, there's usually a going rate for a bride um, under which fathers will not accept uh, offers from grooms. Well, you can imagine that over time, there's inflationary pressure. Uh, and that each father is looking at every other father and looking to um, increase their bride price just a little bit whereupon all other fathers will increase their price and then someone else increases it and so forth. And what you get is these irrational, exuberant, inflationary bubbles of bride price. Uh, and so bride price can increase very swiftly in a short period of time. And in fact, some have argued that it inexorably does so, not unlike uh, real estate markets uh, in certain time periods. Um, and we note that surging bride price is, is uh, also linked to polygyny because in times where bride prices get high, rich men can afford to marry, uh, but poor men cannot. And rich men are marrying polygynously. Uh, and this increase in polygyny also further obstructs the marriage market for disadvantaged young men. So who isn't going to be marrying when bride prices and polygyny rise? Well, it's going to be disadvantaged young men. Uh, and this is so because uh, a man does not have a uh, full standing within a patrilineal culture unless he marries and produces at least one son of his own. And so a deep sense of grievance begins to develop among these disadvantaged young men under the, the context of increasing bride price and polygyny. Uh, and uh, marriage for them may be significantly delayed or, or maybe impossible entirely. Well, what we've seen um, from case studies and field uh, reports is that rebel groups offer to solve that marriage market obstruction problem for these young men. Uh, they offer to uh, uh, make sure that they have the requisite bride price or in some cases, they offer to find them brides themselves. Uh, an excellent case of that latter phenomenon, of course, is Boko Haram. Um, something that the Western media didn't really pick up on is that Boko Haram arose in the early 2000s in part as a reaction to an extremely dramatic rise in bride price in Northern Nigeria. And that Boko Haram has always used these very high bride prices as a recruiting strategy. Um, we all know about the girls that have been kidnapped, like the, the Chibok girls. Uh, but what went unreported in the Western media, at least, is that there was always a token bride price that would be left behind on the ground as the group left, so that any marriages contracted would be legitimate in their, um, their customary framework. One young lady who was subjected to this horrific practice said, in this crisis, these men can take a wife at no extra charge. Usually it's very uh, expensive to get married, or excuse, to take a wife, very expensive to get married, but not now. Okay? So we can see that tight linkage there between uh, inflationary bride price and increase in rebel and insurgent action. Uh, well, this is not confined to Northern Nigeria. 
And we have excellent case studies showing the very same dynamic in places such as South Sudan, Pakistan, Timor-Leste, uh, and other nations as well. Now, sometimes the linkages that we see between what's going on with women and what's going on at the nation state level are longer term and more structural. Uh, and an example of this uh, could be the, uh, the type of uh, research that Professor Rush was alluding to earlier, which is our research on uh, the alteration of sex ratios worldwide. Um, one of, of what I consider to be sort of the underreported uh, mega trends um, of our world is the increasing masculinization of the world's population. In a normal population, the ratio of, of males to females is approximately 98 males per 100 females. Fewer males because male, males tend to live um, uh, shorter lives than women. Women tend to outlive men. However, the global sex ratio is now documented for sure at being over 101.8 males per 100 females on the planet. And this incredible uh, distortion, right? You may think to yourself, hey, 98, 101, what's the big deal? But we're talking about you know, tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of people here. Um, is not due to any natural disaster or any sort of calamity or any sort of plague. This is entirely man-made, all right, this alteration in sex ratios. When I first started studying the issue of sex ratios uh, in 1990, we could only find uh, five nations that had abnormal birth sex ratios. Uh, and two of them were Hong Kong and Macau, uh, one of which disappeared in the... <laughs> Now, however, uh, there are actually not 18, but 19. Sorry, I miscounted. So we've got Afghanistan, Albania, Armenia, Azerbaijan, China, Georgia, Hong Kong, India, Kosovo, Montenegro, Nepal, North Macedonia, Pakistan, Papua New Guinea, the Philippines, Samoa, Serbia, Taiwan, and Vietnam. Uh, so you can see that th this is not confined to East Asia. It's not confined to South Asia. We have uh, Southeast Asia. We've got uh, the Himalaya regions. We've got uh, Europe in the Balkans. We've got Central Asian republics. We have Pacific Island nations. Uh, this is really an important trend. Uh, furthermore, in addition to these alterations in birth sex ratios, the great migrations of the last decade have also created some interesting uh, sex ratio alterations. So to give an example, in 2015, as you know, we had that huge wave of migration uh, to Europe. And one of the only nations to sort of open its borders and say, please come was Sweden. Well, the first wave of any massive migration is almost always young adult men. All right, and, and that certainly characterized the great migrations of 2015, where 85% of the migrants were young adult men. And they supposedly paved the way for others to follow, right? Others who were not young adult men. Uh, but Sweden also added something very interesting. They, they also said, if you're under 18, we will never deport you for any reason. But they also had no medical checks to determine whether someone was really under 18 or not. So you can imagine that all the young adult men arriving in Sweden during this time period claim to be 16 and 17, right? That's a completely rational thing to do. Well, what happened was that when Sweden went and counted its population the following year, they discovered that the sex ratio among 16 and 17 year olds was 123 males per 100 females, which was actually far worse than China, which had only 117 males per 100 females. So this interesting sex ratio phenomenon even got exported through migration as well, and not just through alteration of birth sex ratios. Well, are there ramifications for the nation state for, for altering one sex ratio to such a degree? Well, 
yes, there's a rather large corpus of research literature now that shows that when you masculinize sex ratios, you get higher crime rates, higher political protest rates. You also exacerbate um, what we've already talked about in terms of marriage market obstruction. So for example, bride prices go through the roof. And one of the fascinating things has been to see the change in China. I, you know, despite the fact that China is a communist country, they still have bride price. And bride prices have gone up 10 times due to the increasing scarcity of women in that, um, that country. And of course, all of this, right, um, enables rebel and insurgent groups to begin to recruit on that basis. Uh, empirical research has also shown that crimes against women, especially uh, trafficking and forced prostitution, but also rape and other types of uh, violent crimes uh, increase as well. And we also see uh, increased mobility restriction on women in societies with masculinized sex ratios. Uh, we also see a uh, much greater HIV and other STD spread, probably because of the increase in trafficking and forced prostitution. And you may even see an altered calculus of deterrence due to an altered perception of the cost of attrition warfare. Uh, most societies in the West uh, absolutely eschew attrition warfare. They simply cannot take the political and manpower costs of a war of attrition. But a country that has a large surplus of young adult men uh, about whom they worry in terms of instability may have a very different view of attrition warfare and that maybe attrition warfare is worth it and not as costly. Uh, to them as it would be to other countries. So is there any hard evidence? Uh, I say this because uh, when I first started to do uh, uh, this sort of a line of, of research, looking at the relationship between what's going on with women and what's going on with nation state outcomes, uh, it was very common to hear that's such an interesting story. Why don't you come back when you have some hard evidence <laughs> about these linkages? And so uh, my, um, my colleagues and I were very keen on making sure that we had rigorous statistical evidence that would accompany uh, this theoretical framework. Uh, and so as mentioned, uh, the, it was actually the US Department of Defense which funded this research. We were able to operationalize that full syndrome that we talked about previously. And let me tell you, that was quite a chore. Um, there was no existing data set, for example, on the prevalence of patrilocal marriage uh, and just try to find a data set about dowry or bride price. You know, they just don't exist. So uh, it took a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of man and woman power uh, to operationalize uh, women's household level disempowerment. Uh, and then uh, we undertook multivariate regression. Obviously we didn't have a time series uh, with seven control variables. So we're controlling for alternate and complementary explanations. And so we looked at uh, sort of nine dimensions of nation state outcomes. Uh, so we were looking at political stability and governance indicators, security and conflict indicators, economic performance, rontourism, health and well-being, demographic indicators, education indicators, social progress indicators, and environmental protection indicators. And we, we you know, one of the things that we did in order to make sure um, that people, again, did not treat this research lightly is we chose as a bar for significance, a very stringent, um, uh, standard, which is uh, rho less than or equal to 0 0.001. <laughs> so I don't know if you're familiar with statistics, but it's typical to use 0 0.05 or 0 0.01. This is 0 0.001. In addition, we were also uh, um, going to make sure that no one could accuse us of cherry picking the outcome variables. 
So we actually looked at 161 outcome variables. I'm certainly not going to read these, but you can imagine that we had multiple indicators for each of those nine dimensions uh, because we wanted to make sure that no one could say, oh, you chose this index. But, you know, what if you had chosen this index? Would you still get the same results? Well, we wanted to make sure that was not an issue. So what were the findings? Well, I'm pleased to tell you that they were uh, even, even more, I think, uh, profound than I thought they were going to be. So um, for example, 22 measures of political instability, 93.8% of our model runs showed the syndrome as being highly significant with either the largest or second largest effect size in the entire multivariate model. 35 measures of conflict and insecurity, 75%. 10 measures of terror, 80%. The incidence of terror is strongly associated with the subjugation of women, just as our theory was projecting. Economic performance, 62.5%. Public health and well being, over 70%. Environmental preservation, 85%. There really is something to the notion that you treat Mother Earth like you treat other women in your society. Demographic security, over 70%. Educational attainment, 60%. Social progress, 75%. So overall, over all of those uh, 122 model runs incorporating 161 variables, 71.3% of the model runs found the subjugation of women at the household level to be highly significant and either the most determinative factor in the uh, equation or the second most determinative factor. Um, if you're into odds, we also ran some logistic regressions. So uh, a logistic regression uh, allows you to say, um, how many times the risk do you have of having a bad outcome if you get one step worse on your subjugation of women? So for every step you get worse on the subjugation of women, you have twice the chance of being a fragile state three and a half times the chance of having a government that's more autocratic, less effective, and more corrupt. One and a half times the chance of being unstable and violent. 1.28 times the chance of experiencing terrorism. 1.4 times the chance of your country being poor and in economic decline. One and a half times the chance of having a low GDP per capita. The same for low environmental quality. Almost twice the chance of having a high fertility rate. Almost twice the chance of having a higher incidence of preventable deaths. And almost uh, twice the chance of scoring badly on the global hunger index. So this is pretty important stuff. Uh, Professor Rose McDermott at Brown University, I think really nailed, um, nailed it. She said, the, the findings are clear, consistent, and statistically robust across the board. In fact, the results are the kind of thing most social scientists strive for, but almost never find in the course of their careers. If these findings were about something not related to women, chances are they would be treated as revolutionary in international relations theory. Indeed, the effects are much stronger than those supporting the notion of the democratic peace that has spawned an entire cottage industry of inquiry. And she says, I leave it to the reader to ponder why powerful effects regarding the treatment of women on the health and security of states do not receive such extensive attention. Good question. Why do we get these results? Well, again, I'm giving you only an abridged version of the book, but let me just point out that we think that there's at least three causal pathways here. Um, so the first causal pathway we see is, is boot camp, right? That is the socialization of every new member of the society. Uh, we believe there's no better training camp for political violence and instability than lived domestic terror perpetration, lived domestic corruption and exploitation, lived domestic autocracy. When you're experiencing that within the household, you see that it is functional at getting people what they want. And it becomes seen as normal, normative, unremarkable, the way things are done, all right? This is the kind of political order that will seem the most natural to your people. Secondly, as we've seen with sex ratio alteration and bride price and polygyny, 
Um, the syndrome is also creating structural goads. It's as if you had a stool and you purposefully sawed off one of the legs. All right, that stool is going to be unstable no matter what you do. All right, you can prop it up in a number of different ways. You can try to get around the fact that you've sawed off one of the, the legs of the stool, but it will always be an unstable stool. You have built it in structurally. And then lastly, the last causal pathway is that you are specifically disempowering women. That is the very people who could say things like, I don't think this political violence is going to be very useful for our society, or I think we should be paying more attention to health and welfare of our citizens and so forth. So you are muting, you are silencing the voices of those who would have a, a, a very alternative view uh, of the functionality of this approach. Now, I'm oftentimes asked uh, to give these research findings um, back in DC, usually to the military or to the intelligence community or to the State Department. Um, and I, I often um, preface my conclusion by saying, do you consider yourself a national security realist? And 100% of the time, everyone's like, yep, I'm a realist. Because I mean, what does it say that you're a nationalist security idealist, right? It means you're just a woolly headed thinker. So everyone believes they're a realist. So I say, okay, well, in, in light of these empirical findings, are you a realist? If you believe that what's going on with women is going to affect the security and stability and governance and so forth of the nation state. And they're like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's actually the way the world works. And so I say a further question. I say, look, are you a realist if you believe that the women, peace and security agenda as outlined in instruments like uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1325 or the US National Action Plan for Women, Peace and Security is really in the national interest? And they're like, yeah, they're like, yeah maybe so. But then I ask them the question, which is the question at which they all sort of pause. And I say, can you call yourself a realist if you don't believe these things? And that kind of sets them back a little because uh, I can tell you that even to this date in the security studies academic community, as well as in the world of national security policy making, what's going on with women as seen as something that is orthogonal or perhaps at best tangential to what's going on with national security. It is not seen as a core national security interest. Uh, but our research we're hoping will change those attitudes. Well, at that point, my audience is usually saying, okay, all right, all right, I'm with you. All right, I believe it does matter. But what would really change, right? Would anything really change about say US foreign policy uh, if, uh, if we considered the situation of women? So I say, well, let's, let's consider that question. I say, hey, if the US is not tracking what's going on with women, how can it expect to have an effective foreign policy? For example, all right, our political risk analysis, our conflict early warning models, right? None of them contain any gender variables whatsoever. But in terms of situational awareness, how are you going to anticipate instability in other countries if, for example, you're not tracking things like trajectory of bride price, right? Or sex ratio alterations or things of this nature? I don't think you can. I don't think you have full situational awareness. How will the U.S. decide which subnational actors are most likely to bring stability in the long term if one doesn't example, uh, examine how each group treats women before making a commitment. I mean, obviously the ultimate example in this regard is the Mujahideen that we supported after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in December, 1979. Uh, we just decided that, you know, uh, whoever was opposing uh, the Mujahideen were friends of ours, right? My enemy's enemy is my friend. But if we really wanted stability in Afghanistan, we also would have asked ourselves, well, how does the Mujahideen treat women? And how does it intend to treat women when they get into power? And I think we all uh, found out 
exactly what the answer to that question was as the Mujahideen morphed into the Taliban and was extraordinarily, even horrifically oppressive to women and drove their country even into greater levels of poverty and instability and certainly uh, terrorism, right? But there was no one at the National Security Council table back in those days who was saying, we're not sure that these Mujahideen are a good bet. Let's take a look at how they intend to treat women. No one was even asking the question. How will the US avoid the trap of peace negotiations where the rights of women are bargained away to make uh, quote unquote peace between warlords if it doesn't understand the linkage between sustainable peace and the empowerment of women? You simply can't have a stable country or a sustainable peace if you throw women under the bus. Uh, and I think what's very sad, of course, right now is that is pretty much what we're doing to the women of Afghanistan. How will the US track which of its own citizens are the greatest domestic terror threat if domestic violence is not viewed as a form of domestic terror? Okay. There is a very, very tight association between each of our mass murderers and terrorists in the United States, mass shooters over the last 20 years and uh, whether those individuals had any uh, allegations, uh, arrests or convictions for domestic violence against a mother, a sister, a wife, an ex-wife, a girlfriend or an ex-girlfriend, very tight. Um, so uh, un until we start seeing that domestic violence is the boot camp for domestic terrorism, I don't think we're gonna have a good handle on which of our citizens we should be keeping track of. Immigration strategy, right? We certainly with the last administration, there was, you know, some sort of reasoning about if you're from a particular country, you know, you're a problem. Well, that's not it, right? That's not it, all right? The, the issue is, uh, you know, whether individuals who come to this country are, are going to be undermining um, women's rights. Uh, and that is a question that nations have become much more attuned towards. So for example, uh, Australia now has questions on the citizenship test that asks you whether it is legal to beat your spouse, whether it is legal to have your daughter's genitals cut, whether it is legal to arrange a marriage for a child. Um, because they see that it is the importation of practices like this that are the issue. And that those who are willing to come to Australia and give up such practices are very welcome, but that those who are intent on keeping those practices are probably going to undermine the security of Australia in the long run. Norway does something similar, Canada does something similar as well. How will the US know that ending child marriage worldwide would probably do more for world peace than almost any other investment? Okay, oftentimes I see schemes for how are we gonna bring stability to the world and none of them mention uh, the key factor that mires countries in intergenerational poverty, ignorance and misery. And that's the child marriage of girls, right? Making a, a, you know, a, a 13 year old a mother making a 14 year old a mother. Uh, this is, uh, this is, is, is a prime example. If you curse your women, you curse your nation state. Um, no country with prevalent child marriage has ever progressed significantly in economic terms, in technological terms, in governance terms and so forth. But yet child marriage has not been a priority. Um, for, for example, our foreign aid initiatives. How would the US know when exporting democracy makes sense and when it doesn't? Uh, well, I think here an analysis of what's going on with women can be very, very helpful, right? If you're coding virtually all of those subordinative practices concerning women, then to export democracy is probably going to actually pour gasoline on the fire of tribal, clan and ethnic um, conflict. 
However, we know that there are countries that are transitioning away from such um, severe subordination of women. And it is those countries where greater pluralism, um, democratization may have um, the greatest salutary effects. So in sum, I guess I believe that one day the idea that you that foreign policy or national security policy could ignore the situation of women will be seen as laughably naive. I, I honestly believe that one day they will look back on our textbooks, they will look back at the table of contents at our top security journals, and they will scratch their heads or even laugh that it was considered to be in essence kind of a, a womanless world. Uh, and I, I think that, um, uh, that it will be seen as absolutely imperative uh, that the first political order be examined when looking at security affairs. So I think uh, you know, we're, we're on the cusp of a rethinking of what national security is and how we get it. I think uh, given everything that we've just looked at in this presentation, it's fair to say that women's insecurity profoundly and significantly undermines state security. I, th I think actually it was Hillary Clinton who when she was Secretary of State said it best in 2012 when she said, the subjugation of women is a threat to the common security of our world and to the national security of our country. I furthermore think that disrupting the weak points of that syndrome may be foundational to undercutting the roots of instability, conflict, and ineffective governance worldwide. And I think only by adopting those uh, women, peace, and security lenses can we see these linkages and make our policies more effective. So that's the end of my presentation. For those of you who are interested in data and information about women's um, situation worldwide, I would uh, refer you to our free online database at uh, womanstats.org. And now I'm uh, really excited to uh, talk about and hear your questions. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Hudson. This is Brian speaking now. I'm gonna transmit some of the questions along with Jeremy Weissman. Um, can you hear me okay? Good. Um, Dr. Hudson, first question we have from the uh, audience is what's the single most important change for example, custody arrangements or inheritance law to a legal system that would have the greatest downstream effects on nation state stability? That is a wonderful question. And I actually have um, a slide that I wanna share with you about that. Let me go ahead and do that right now, if I can. Uh, let's see here. Okay. All right. If you can see that, there's that diagram again of the uh, syndrome components, kind of these interlocking uh, systematic means of subjugating women. Uh, and I, I think there's some weak points. I really do. Um, let's talk for a moment about sex ratio alteration. Um, as you know, I've been studying that for Oh, good heavens. I've been studying that for almost 30 years now. Oh, that makes me feel so old. <laughs> um, but one of the, the single most effective ways of uh, undoing um, a tendency towards sex selective abortion or female infanticide is to provide old age pensions. And that's precisely what we found in South Korea, which is the only nation within uh, the last 150 to 200 years that has gone from a very, very abnormal masculinized sex ratio to a normal sex ratio. Uh, and one of the, the, the very critical elements of that change was providing old age pensions. Because prior to that time, in order to avoid utter poverty in old age, people would have to rely on their clan 
right? In South Korea, clans are very, very big. And these were all patrilineal clans. So it was your, your son, not your daughter, but your son who would have the responsibility within the clan to take care of you. Um, so that's, you know, as, as uh, family sizes began to shrink in South Korea, as they often do post-industrialization, um, sex racial alteration began to be worse because while people had smaller families, they still needed those sons. They, at least they needed one son and they were gonna get him one way or the other. But when the South Korean government began to introduce old age pensions, there was a really interesting shift. And the shift was over what would be considered an eye blink uh, in terms of demography, which was about 20 years. Uh, it went from seeing sons as being vitally, vitally important to seeing daughters as being vitally, vitally important. And it turns out that while sons would perhaps write you a check, it was daughters who would come over with food and make sure you were warm and take care of you and make sure your laundry was done and so forth. That with the pension from the government and the care they got from their daughters is that they were having a pretty darn good older age. Um, so I think that's critically important. Um, I think over on the right-hand side, you see uh, urbanization. I think it's very, very difficult to maintain patrilineality and patrilocal marriage in a highly urbanized uh, setting. Uh, and so I think there's a natural subverting of those norms with increased urbanization. Then uh, I think there's there, the, the two red arrows are referring to areas in which I think the international community has made some headway. So low age of marriage for girls. Uh, it used to be that, uh, <laughs> you know, if we looked at world averages, right, the average age of marriage for girls worldwide, right, would have been somewhere between 15 and 16. And that there were many, many countries that had laws that were perfectly fine with marriages of say 14, 15 and 16 year olds. To a lesser extent, we even had countries that were fine with marriages of any girl who had hit puberty. So as long as she'd had her first menstruation, she was fair game to be married. I should note that Yemen, which is currently in the midst of a civil war, has no minimum age of marriage for girls whatsoever, none. So we even have uh, girls as young as five who are being actually married um, and expected to consummate marriages with older uh, rooms. No wonder they're having a civil war. That's just me, sorry about that. <clears throat> Um, but um, since 2000, since the turn of the century, we've had something like uh, 54, 55 nations that have increased their minimum marriage age for girls uh, to 18. And this is a huge step in the right direction. And I really credit um, both IGOs, that is intergovernmental organizations, as well as NGOs, non-governmental organizations, for getting these changes in the law. Now, as we all know, just because you change a law doesn't mean you've changed practice on the ground. And that's still true. That is still true. We uh, practice lags behind law. Um, but I, I think that people um, are, are now understanding more that having children bear children is really bad, not just for the family, but for the entire society. And that it's very difficult to escape those shackles. So as enforcement catches up with law, I think that's gonna be another rip in the, the straight jacket. And then uh, lastly, I think male control of resources, especially land is another place where there's been some progress. Um, so again, quite a number of nations have passed laws that entitled married women to joint title on marital property, including land. The problem is that a lot of women don't know they have that right, or they don't know how to exercise that right by actually getting their name on the title. And, and yes, I believe some are still intimidated from exercising that right by threats of violence. So for example, in Albania, which is in Europe, uh, even though Albania has perfectly equal property rights laws on the books, um, 
uh, of the, the, the land and real estate properties in Albania, only 8% of those have a woman on the title. So I think uh, a major push towards uh, getting married women's name on the title of property is also uh, a, a way in which we can begin to uh, dampen um, some of that, um, that really oppressive uh, subjugation of, of women. Thank you for that question. That was excellent. All right, so uh, this next question is, you were famously cited by Emma Watson of Harry Potter fame. On International Women's Day 2020, Watson shared on Instagram, for me, this book illuminates how we got where we are today and along with it, a way forward. Um, can you touch on Emma Watson's important statement about the way forward? Where do societies go from here in terms of alleviating gender gaps and women's subjugation? What is the way forward? Oh, by the way, I was totally tinkled pink. I, I, you know, being of a different generation, but, you know, I loved Hermione. My daughters love Hermione. So uh, I was seriously fangirling throughout the uh, entire interview. It was just lovely. And she's a very intelligent uh, young lady, a very, uh, and very good hearted. And I think she really sincerely you know, wants, you know, to help in this area and her visibility gives her a platform to do that. So I say, bless her. She's, she's terrific. Um, well, yeah, uh, the book that she was referring to is not this particular book that we've been talking about, but another book, which you may be interested in, it's called Sex and World Peace. Uh, and um, in fact, we're, we're actually updating it this year because it's been so popular. Um, and I think a lot of people um, would still like to see it remain in print. Um, but in that book, we talk about how it's really necessary to have kind of a kind of a pincer movement. And what we mean by that is that there's got to be some top down strategies, you know, where, where governments are, are actually trying to make things better for women. Uh, but that an understanding that those top-down strategies are not going to be very effective unless we have kind of a bottom-up strategy at the, to match it, um, where um, practices actually change at the ground level. Um, we all know that you can have wonderful laws on the books for women, and yet the reality on the ground is 180 degrees different. Um, so to me, yeah, that's partially an enforcement issue, but it's also, you know, an indication that um, hearts and minds, right, need to be, um, if you will, woken up to, to the harm, um, you know, that's done by subjugating women so profoundly. Uh, and so we, in that book, we do talk about what governments can do, and then we talk about what, uh, what people can do. Um, uh, just at the ground level, starting with their interpersonal relationships uh, and, and going outward. Uh, so for example, um, I, I often tell my male students, I say, look, we know from research that one of the most important ways in, in which the subjugation of women continues is that when men are alone and talk about women, they tend to talk about them in a, in a very derogatory fashion and make jokes and, and other types of things, rate women, whatever. And I say, look, you don't need to be some sort of hero that stands up and says, this is wrong. You know, you don't need to do that. Just don't join in. All right. Don't laugh at the joke. Just sort of stand there with kind of a blank look on your face. Don't give other men props, all right, for... Uh, disrespecting women, right? And what men are looking for in those, you know, intermale conversations is, right, a sense of belonging, a sense of, yeah, you know, uh, people respect me in this group. So if, if you refuse to give rewards, right, to, to other males who are disrespecting women, you can begin to really change a culture. I tell them you can also do that when you're at the table or in a classroom with women. Empirical research shows that women are far more likely to be interrupted in a discussion than men. What can you do? Well, you can say, uh, wait just a minute, Jennifer didn't get to finish her thought. 
I would really like to hear what Jennifer has to say. All right, you can just, just, just do something as simple as that. Number one, you've called her by her name. You've actually humanized her. She's not just a woman at the table. This is Jennifer, All right? And number two, you're, you're actually interested in what she has to say, which means you're signaling to other men at the table that they should be interested in what she has to say too. You know, for women, right, there are equally powerful things you can do, right? Uh, you know, one of the first things I tell my women students is I say, look, walk, talk, act like an equal. There will be all these pressures to defer, to be silent, to um, express a, a lack of confidence in your own views, um, because that's what you're supposed to do. And I say, just let those fly by, right? Just be impervious to all the social signals uh, and just pretend like you don't get those signals at all and just you know, behave like an equal because how are men ever gonna learn to relate to women as equals if women don't actually you know, live their lives in such a way, right? They, they're denied opportunities to learn and to grow. So even in our interpersonal relationships, I think there's something there. Right, but I, you know, I think there's obviously uh, other things that can be done, right, through activism and advocacy and lawsuits and uh, female interpretation of things that have only been interpreted by males, such as scripture and law and so forth. I think there's a lot that can be done to change practice. Um, so, uh, but we can start with our own circle. We can start with where we're at. Uh, Dr. Hudson, we have another question that really is about what can be done. So let me, let me just read this to you. What is the most important action we can take to curb the rates of domestic violence or domestic terrorism? One out of three women in the U.S. are now expected to experience domestic violence in their lifetimes. But what can we actually do in terms of societal action? Oh, I am so glad that you asked that question because I really feel that the reservoir, if you will, the reservoir that allows this subordinative first political order to resurge is tightly linked to the level of violence against women in society. I really, really do. So I, I do believe that unless uh, a society is willing to strongly tackle the issue of domestic violence, the gains for women can be easily reversed. And let me tell you that although the US appeared sort of bright green on that map, it was just on the cusp of being light green. And that was due to the, you know, really relatively high levels of violence against women in US society. All right, so I, I totally believe that. Uh, so I, I think that there have actually been some very innovative and creative approaches uh, to, um, to tackling domestic violence. Um, but I also know that it's a double-edged sword for women. Let me explain. Clearly the key is to make domestic violence non-functional for the perpetrator. It doesn't get him what he wants. It gets him the opposite. It gets him things he doesn't want. That, I mean, clearly that is the only way to go. But yet, right, we have seen that uh, perpetrators then take that as such an existential threat, if you will, that violence against women may be escalated to the max. Uh, and so we see that women are at greatest risk of being killed if they call the police, if they try to leave. Uh, and so I, I, I agree with you that I think that this is a very difficult issue. At the same time that we aggressively uh, crack down on domestic violence, can we also aggressively protect women? So far, we have not done a good job. All right, sure, you can take out, you know, a, uh, you know, stalking order or whatever, no contact order. That doesn't stop these people, all right? It doesn't stop these people. 
So I'm not going to give you a silver bullet, but I'm going to I'm going to tell you that those are the things that have to be done. Uh, and I I am, as I said in Professor Wiseman's class, I am a jaded optimist. Hmm. And what I mean by that is I know full well how this stuff doesn't work, and yet I am still hopeful that there can be progress. And one of the reasons that I am hopeful is that there is a clear continuum of the rate of domestic violence across countries, right? So the, the lowest percentage we can find in the wild right, is 20% of women can expect domestic violence at some point in their lives. But contrast that with nations such as Afghanistan, where 87% of women say they have experienced domestic violence in the last 12 months. Okay. That's a huge difference, right? And that means that we can have progress. I think uh, we should never give, you know, throw up our hands and say, we'll never solve this. Will it be a recurring problem? Yes. Can we make strides? Yes. Uh, can we change the needle? Yes, I believe we can. Uh, but it's going to take, I think, a consciousness that this is not just some little thing that's happening behind closed doors, but that this is not just a crime against the woman, it is a crime against the entire society, right? That's gonna be important. Thank you, that's a brilliant question. It gets to the heart of the matter. All right, I think we have time for one last question. And this one, I believe, sort of extends a little bit on the last question. Um, so this one asks, uh, the United States has been caught in a period of inner turmoil looking more inward than outward. Uh, in relation, US leadership, such as it is, seems at stake in the world. On slide 20, you suggested applying your findings or your research to the US context. Can you speak more to the role gender plays in US domestic stability? Equally important, what remedies might you propose in the US context? Wow, I'm just blown away by the sophistication of these questions. That is also a brilliant question. I think that uh, touches on things that I've not written about, but which I think about all the time, which is what role, right, does, uh, uh, does the subjugation of women play, right, in our political battles today? I, I certainly see that um, in addition to the high levels of violence against women, which are not being uh, sincerely uh, addressed by our, our government, um, that I also see a wide variety of actors which seem to blame women for somehow the state the country is in. Um, once in a blue moon, I only do it once in a blue moon because it's just so horrible that I can't stay there. I'll try to go to some of these subreddits that are men's rights activists place, the manosphere, uh, and the absolute virulence and hatred of women expressing that women should be put in concentration camps and forcibly impregnated. And it's just horrifying to me. So it certainly seems to me that there are certain forces right, in which misogyny is somehow tied up with their political beliefs, with their sense of nationalism. Uh, and, and, and that to me is, is really scary. I think uh, also as an individual, I've noticed at the progressive rollback of women's uh, reproductive rights uh, and, and how uh, it, it, it's going beyond even what would be considered a middle of the road um, um, kind of approach to say abortion rights. Um, so uh, for example, um, I was just alerted by a student uh, that in Tennessee, a bill has been proposed that the father of an unborn uh, child or fetus uh, can veto an abortion. There is no exception for rape or incest. So if a woman has been raped, her husband, her, her rapist, excuse me, must give permission for an abortion. I'm having a hard time understanding how in the United States in the year 2021, 
anyone could believe that somehow that's appropriate, even if you're against abortion rights, generally speaking, isn't that utterly cold and cruel hearted? So I think, again, there is this. And, and please don't think that I'm giving the left a, a free pass. I, I think I've seen some deep misogyny on the left as, as well. Um, you know, telling women that their grievances are not as important as other people's grievances and it's time for women to shut up and sit down. Uh, so I'm deeply worried about how women and women's rights have become some sort of football uh, in the political situation that our country now finds itself in. Uh, and I'm not surprised, right? Because certainly my theory says that in times of political turmoil, this is going to happen. The whole women question is going to resurge. But I guess as an American, I, I do feel a degree of shock at some of the deep strains of misogyny that I see on both the right and the left that worry me very significantly. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Hudson, we just got one, one last question. You've touched on personal ethics, international ethics. This question has to do with business ethics. Should a US business um, in one of these countries that won't change its policies or laws regarding the sub subjugation of women, should a US company pull out? Does a US company have an ethical duty to sort of closed shop in a country that is failing miserable on this issue? Oh, I have a, a, a schizophrenic response to that, okay? One is, is that um, there have been some really interesting attempts to have businesses kind of alter the dynamics in some of these countries. So for example, for a while, uh, for a couple of years, I was involved in the US-Pakistan Women's Council, which is a public-private partnership that is designed to increase business and entrepreneurial opportunities for women in Pakistan, which is, well, let's face it, that's a country that encodes a lot of those uh, syndrome uh, beads. Um, and so, for example, um, mentoring women as to how to become part of a global supply chain, um, uh, seed money for women entrepreneurs and so forth. So I think there's kind of a starfish approach that says, even if I can't change Pakistan, right? I can make sure that my supply chain is in enriching and empowering women entrepreneurs in Pakistan and I can provide training and things like this. So I am all for that. And I, I certainly think that that was kind of the approach of Ivanka Trump, right? She had a women's gender and, ah, I'm forgetting the uh, meaning of the acronym, but it was WGDP, uh, in which that would be the focus, right? So instead of changing uh, child marriage, right, you go in and you um, enrich women so that they have more power to say, we are not marrying our daughter off at age 14. And, and I can see the logic of that. But my, and the other half of the schizo response is to tell you that I, I think there's something to what you say. I'm involved right now in a project that is uh, uh, designed to show uh, companies how if they altered their political risk analysis models to include gender variables, mm -hmm. that they would be shifting their investment from certain countries where women are really, really, really terribly subjugated to countries where women are less subjugated. And that as nations began to understand that investment decisions were being made in part upon um, these gender variables, the things might also change for women. So uh, there's a schizo response for you, uh, but I think there's room for both of these things to happen. Excellent question, by the way. Well, we've kept you well, well beyond what we said we would do. And uh, on behalf of the Center for International Education and Professor Rush, and on behalf of the Mudd Center, um, 
Professor Weissman and, and myself and others, we want to just thank you. you. You've given us a, well, you've given us some realism. You've given us numbers. You've given us some hope. Um, so we have a lot to think about and talk about on campus and over Zoom and other, other devices in the coming months. So thank you very much. Once all, once things get back to normal a little bit, I wish you would come to campus and, and uh, say more. I would be delighted to. I've had such a wonderful visit and the quality of the questions has really shown me the depth of discussion, um, the depth of intellectual curiosity that you have among your students and faculty. So Professor Murchison, thank you for everything. Uh, and I would always be delighted. Count on me to come whenever it becomes possible. Excellent. Thanks, Thanks so Pauline. much. Thank, Thank you. you both. And good night. Good night.